Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Now we are in the westernmost point of the United States as a think tank that does research on problems facing the economy and government and comes up with solutions. Well, I'm so pleased to say that today we're going to be talking with the think tank that is on the easternmost point of the United States, and that is from Puerto Rico. Live today, we have the founder of a brand new economic policy and government transparency think tank called the Center for Integrity and Public Policy in Puerto Rico. Now, what do Puerto Rico and Hawaii have in common? A lot, because much of the situation in our economy is impacted by many of the similar problems, uh, similar situations. One, for example, is that we're both islands. And another is that there is a federal law called the Jones Act that has had tremendous impact on our own economy. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well as government transparency. But please, welcome to the program today, Alvin Quinones, who is the founder and president of the CIPP, the Center for Integrity and Public Policy in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And that's where you are, Alvin. San Juan, right? Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Yes, uh, here in uh, San Juan. Uh, very similar tropical climates. Indeed, and when I say aloha to you, what is the greeting from Puerto Rico? Bienvenido. Oh, very good. Well, the same to you, Alvin. Alvin, you're in business today, and, and you've got a growing and booming career with a, several of your colleagues and friends. What is it that you have now created in Puerto Rico, and why did you do so? Uh, yes, so we started the SIP, uh, as we call it here, uh, a few years ago, uh, primarily because we noticed a lack of uh, interesting policy solutions. Um, much of the political discourse uh, revolved around um, federal aid as solutions to the island's problems. And we were interested in different solutions. How can we uh, empower communities and individuals to find the solutions for themselves? And uh, initially, we noticed that there was a lack of data to even begin to analyze the problems that we faced. And so we started what uh, today is known as Open Puerto Rico, or Abre Puerto Rico. Uh, it's our open data transparency portal. Well, that's a very interesting uh, thing, because in Hawaii, we have the same situation. We want to see policy change. So we've started a think tank called the Grassroot Institute, and it begins with research. And we happen to have a portal for transparency and information called Open Hawaii. So uh, it looks like we're on the same track. We both recognize the importance of good research behind policy. But you've got a major challenge in Puerto Rico that we've been reading about in the United States over the last year and a half, and, and that is what sometimes is called the bankruptcy of, of your basic economy. Can you tell us uh, very concisely what's actually gone on with the Puerto Rican economy? Yeah, so we've seen a lot of challenges, uh, primarily a uh, escape of a lot of Puerto Ricans to the U.S. mainland for looking for greater opportunities, which reduces the capacity for the economy to grow. Uh, most of those people who leave are in their productive years probably have a job already on the island. They just feel that there's greater opportunity for them outside. And on top of that, the government has had to uh, implement a lot of austerity measures. So the uh, economy here was primarily fueled by government spending. And so as the government contracts, uh, Puerto Ricans leave, um, the economy has uh, mm. obviously contracted as well. So there's that double-edged sword of the government funding. Uh, the, having the government play such a significant role in the economy, the bottom falls out, actually, when the government is, is not able to continue putting funding in. You mentioned something interesting at the very beginning, and that is that one of the situations in Puerto Rico is that people seem to have, the, they, they do have the habit of looking to the federal government for money. That's a big thing in Hawaii. A great deal of our economy is fueled by subsidies from the federal government. Tell us a little a bit about that and how that experience has helped or hurt Puerto Rico. Yeah, I, I think... Um you know, it, it provides a short-term solution to problems, right? We had the 936 laws, which were uh, incentivized certain factories coming here, particularly the pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. took advantage of those back in the 90s. Um, and that created a certain sense of prosperity. Um, we also have a lot of the uh, subsidies from uh, federal uh, education and health care. And so that, t again, tends to f create this false sense of buoyancy. Um, but as you pointed out, when the money starts to dry up, uh, those incentives uh, created a sense in which the economy locally didn't really have to be competitive. 
Uh, we didn't have to provide any other types of uh, complementary services. And people locally didn't develop the skills to really keep those types of enterprises going on our own. Mm. So uh, very, you know, just really didn't help as a long-term solution. So would you say that you've seen that a very big role on the part of the federal government has created a sense of dependency, indeed codependency, so that it's actually stunted the growth of industries within Puerto Rico over the past several decades? Well, that's absolutely true. That's correct. And then uh, we continue to look to the federal government to solve our problems. So even now, as we're facing these new fiscal challenges, we continue to discuss about uh, new incentives and new federal giveaways. Mm -hmm how to increase federal funding for our health care system. Um, and it's constantly looking to the federal government to uh, cover over the gaps in our own economy. Well, it's clear that you don't think that a federal bailout of Puerto Rico's economy is the ultimate long-term solution. What is the solution? How would you, as a think tank, advise government to rebuild the economy of Puerto Rico? It's a great question there. And I think what we really have to look at is how to create Puerto Rico as a competitive location for businesses on its own merits. So what do we do to really provide a quality education here in Puerto Rico? Uh, we are at the juncture of uh, two cultures similar to Hawaii, you know, Pacific and Asian cultures uh, as well as American. Here in Puerto Rico, we bridge Latin American and American cultures. Yet we don't take advantage enough of a bilingual um, opportunities to really expand markets. We are, uh, labor market laws are very rigid and have mm. a lot of invisibility. So you start to create a lot of pressures in which you're not building up your human capital and you're stifling businesses from taking advantage of the human capital you do have. Um, right there are two very low hanging fruit that you could uh, do a lot more with. You talk about competition and economic market expansion. Uh, th these are qualities that are present in a free market, one that is freer at least than one highly controlled by government. Uh, do you see Puerto Rico as a place where free market concepts will be able to work? Uh, I do. Uh, you see that today with people's hunger for a different way in politics. Um, people are tired of the same old stories, similar to what you're seeing in the United States. Uh, they are looking for changes. Many Puerto Ricans are going to places like Florida and Texas, which uh, pride themselves as being areas that uh, encourage growth, encourage job creation, um, don't try to stifle um, entrepreneurs. And I think they see the success of those types of policies and want to see those here at home. I think what we're seeing is that money walks, and it's with the feet that people show the, their votes and what, what they really prefer, and they're going to where they can find economic opportunity, which is what you want. Puerto Rico really to offer them. You know, in Hawaii we're experiencing the same thing, whether we call it the brain drain or anything else, it's an exodus of the greatest talent from our state simply because some of our recent college graduates uh, won't be able to afford a mortgage on a home for decades if they stay in Hawaii or the kinds of career opportunities. Uh, tell us a little bit about that brain drain of the younger generation in Puerto Rico. Well, you know, that's a you know, same issue here. A similar, slightly different in that our housing costs are actually quite affordable, uh, fortunately. Um, but if you don't have a job to afford the home, it's not very useful, mm. right? Um, and so we see a lot of people leaving for Washington, D.C., uh, especially. I think they see an opportunities in federal government and federal law, uh, specifically seeing how that's impacted Puerto Rico. I think they see that the need is to change stat, uh, policy at the federal level rather than reclaiming our own empowerment as a, in our own self-determination in that regard of economic development. You talk, um, yes. you talk about empowerment and self-determination in terms of economic development. And in, in reality, both Hawaii and Puerto Rico are ranked fairly low in regional and global measures of economic freedom. So we face a common problem, and that is something that suppresses economic freedom vestiges of a protectionism that started many, many generations ago, economic protectionism. And I know that you're very familiar with a, a venerable form of protectionism called the Jones Act, based upon some laws in 1920. Tell us a bit about what that Jones Act is. So the Jones Act requires that any shipping that comes to Puerto Rico, Hawaii, or Alaska, or any U.S. territory, uh, either be under the flag of a U.S. ship uh, or depart from a U.S. port. So it increases the cost for delivery of all sorts of goods, and both of us being islands, 
we have to have a lot delivered to us. I think in Puerto Rico, we import about 80% of our foodstuffs, uh, not including many other consumer goods. And so it, it creates an artificial tax on um, all goods that are here. And I know you all in Kauai suffer that greatly with just uh, the cost of milk and gasoline and, so, uh, and, so on, and amongst other things. Right. As you mentioned, the Jones Act has to do with shipping, and it's been around since the 1920s. It was designed to protect the shipping industry by removing competition. But in the process, it actually has created a disincentive for the shipping industry to actually grow. And as a result, we have such a scarcity of ships, the costs of them are so high. But the Jones Act says we have to buy them from the United States whenever we're doing cargo transport between two American ports, which includes Puerto Rico. Let me ask you how the experience has been of telling Washington, D.C. that this federal law is oppressive to the economy of Puerto Rico? Well, I think uh, similarly to uh, as Hawaii, right, I don't think uh, we uh, punch below our weight, if you will. Um, you know, Puerto Rico is, if we were a state, we'd be about 21st, I think, in terms of size. Um, but uh, we still have very little influence in telling our story. And when you look at the unions and the other vested interests that benefit from the uh, Jones Act, um, you know, there's very little reason for Washington to hear us out. So the maritime union that funds candidates who support the Jones Act is very, very powerful in Washington, D.C., uh, and so it's very difficult to get a hearing. Have, have your political leaders, I, I know your representatives in D.C. and the governor of Puerto Rico, have all appealed to Washington, D.C. for some reprieve. Uh, have they given up or have they become frustrated? Do they feel they have a, an action plan that could make a difference? Um, an action plan I'm not sure about, but uh, given up, they have not. Um, so it's definitely an item we bring up often. Uh, as you know, we are recently, there was the PROMESA bill that was put in place to uh, resolve the situation of the island's debts. And we had hoped there might be some Jones Act alleviation in that process. Um, so people continue to labor and struggle for some re uh, alleviation of what that the impact is there. Um, but uh, it, it's interesting because of one of the few issues that across the political parties here in Puerto Rico, there's resounding support uh, to see some action around the Jones Act. You know, and that's something that actually benefits the rest of the nation. While not all regions realize this, the Jones Act has uh, a, an impact down the line on every state's economy in the United States to some extent. Uh, it's definitely apparent in states like Hawaii or, or California where we have coastline and, and deal with shipping directly, but it also affects everything that is shipped to the coast and then travels by train or bus or, or truck to another destination. So there, there's a residual effect on every single industry uh, and a, every state of the United States, and yet there's very little attention. So I want to commend what many Puerto Ricans are doing. They're, they're, they're raising the level of attention. They're saying this has been part of the cause of the, the demise of our economy and we need some kind of relief from it. So we're going to be working with you. And as you know, you, you've recently become part of a network of think tanks. We'll talk about that at the uh, beginning of the next segment. And in that network, we're going to be working together. My guest today is Alvin Quinones, who is the founder of a think tank in Puerto Rico committed to government transparency and to improving the economy. When we come back, we'll talk with him a little bit more about governments that are open and transparent. Uh, I'm Kili'i Akina on Think Tech Hawaii's Ehana Kako. Don't go away. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi, and you can catch me on Mondays at 11 on Think Tech Hawaii. Stacy to the rescue. See you then. Welcome to Asia in the Wheel. Looking forward to see you next month on October 13, Thursday at 11 o'clock. Aloha, everyone. I hope you've been watching Think Tech Hawaii. But I'm here to invite you to watch me on Viva Hawaii every Monday at 3 p.m. I'm waiting for you. Mahalo. Aloha. My name is John Waihe, and I actually had a small part to do with what's happening today served actually in public office. But if you don't already know that, here's a chance to learn more about what's happening in our state by joining me for Talk Story with John Waihe 
every other Monday. Thank you, and I look forward to your seeing us in the future. Welcome back to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on Monday at 2 p.m. Hawaii time, but our show is broadcast all throughout the world on live internet as well as available on the Think Tech Hawaii website, thinktechhawaii.com. And you can also see our programs on grassrootinstitute.org. That's grassrootinstitute.org. Well, before we resume our program, I do want to say thanks to the wonderful staff and crew here at Think Tech Hawaii who produce about 35 hours of original content every week that is sent all across the world. We talk about the economy, we talk about government, we talk about the arts, we talk about virtually everything that affects human life, it's science, religion, public policy. It's a very fascinating way to get an education of what's going on in Hawaii and the world. We're talking today with the founder of a new think tank in Puerto Rico called the Center for Integrity and Public Policy, Alvin Quinones. And Alvin and his board of directors and the team that have put the think tank together have been welcomed with open arms to a national network of think tanks. In each of the 50 states, there is a designated think tank that fights for the policies of individual liberty, free markets, and limited accountable government. They're not partisan. Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, and others participate in them. And they're not funded by the government or the military or by political parties, so they can say anything they want and nobody loses their job as a result of it. They're truly independent think tanks. And so uh, as we return to Alvin, I want to say congratulations, Alvin, to you and to Center for Integrity and Public Policy for being Puerto Rico's first and only think tank as part of the State Policy Network. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, yeah. what are the resources that, that being part of SPN brings to Puerto Rico and its government and people? Oh, I think, um, you know, what it brings is the ability for us to have a greater voice and really project these types of ideas into the political discourse that there's been a vacuum for here in Puerto Rico. The uh, levers have been pushed mightily on the side of more government involvement, and SPN is giving us this uh, support in both... Um, thinking through strategically and also tactically and how we can push the lever on the other side and create some balance and discourse here. And, and there's a fundamental principle that needs to be practiced that SPN promotes and it's called federalism. It, it isn't what people may think, the growth of the federal branch, it's quite the opposite. Uh, it's the, the concept that power should not go from the state to the federal government. Power should go back to the states and territories where it's closest to home and where you have a form of home rule because the people there who are paying the taxes there, who live there, who have to make the economy work there are the ones who are, should be the most important voice. Uh, how do you see that panning out in, in Puerto Rico? We see, unfortunately, I think a lot of people here see the federal government as their savior. So it's challenging to create that sense of um, how to break that uh, linkage and, and really create an understanding of what federalism means. And um, oftentimes we look at statehood for Puerto Rico as an opportunity to have greater federal dollars. Um, if we were instead to see that as an opportunity to maybe um, release ourselves from certain federal obligations and really express our uh, economic identity on our own, um, as many other states have had, as, such as Texas, Florida, and as you all are trying to do in Hawaii, uh, we'd see much greater opportunity. Mm. You know, one of the things we've tried to do here in Hawaii in order to enhance the opportunity for good public policy uh, to, to be heard and talked about is provide information that people need. We could call this the democratization of information because one of the ways governments stay out of the light of accountability is to withhold data from people or to make it too difficult for people, including journalists and the general public, to get a hold of. So one of the projects that we have here and operate is a website called Open Hawaii. And uh, we post a lot of stuff <laughs> that the government doesn't make available readily. Sometimes we actually have to sue the government in order to get information that belongs to the public. And an amazing thing happens. When we post that information, for example, with one rogue agency here in Hawaii, we got a hold of their checkbook and just posted the check register. The public was able to walk through 
thousands of checks and identify irregularities and fraud and waste and abuse and uh, there have been so many news articles that have been generated by that and action has been taken and in one case a major Supreme Court uh, case benefited from the, uh, the information that was available there and so uh, as I turn to you I know that you're starting some similar programs in Puerto Rico tell us first a little bit about the climate in Puerto Rico in the government in terms of openness and transparency to the people well first let me commend you and your group for what you're doing in Hawaii that's great work uh, we haven't had those kinds of successes yet um, we're doing a lot of uh, the government here obviously speaks that the information is public and you there's laws about that uh, but being public and making it public are very different and so there's a lot of hoops that one has to jump through and so we have tried to break through those procedural barriers um, one of the big things we released was the audited financial statements of municipalities here on the island uh, interestingly enough after we digitized and put on our website about five years of financial statements um, the agency responsible for that uh, soon launched a website of their own putting the financial statements on the web so it was almost like they already had it, um, they just weren't uh, able to do it themselves until we opened the way. Um, we've also done a lot on uh, how all, uh, mayors in Puerto Rico are managing their municipal finances uh, and whether or not they're being responsible stewards of the public's dollar. And uh, it's interesting how often they were to say, well, we aren't a uh, private entity, so we don't have to be that responsible, uh, was almost their response to us. Uh, and really, it's our money, and so they should be that responsible. So we've seen a lot of challenges where people try to push back on the light of day we're bringing. Um, but we've also seen the public be incredibly supportive, and it's earned us a lot of credibility, so I think we're on the right track. The good thing about doing transparency work is that it benefits everyone, and it doesn't carry with it a, a political uh, branding. You're not doing this for Republicans or Democrats or for any of the local parties in Puerto Rico. Uh, so you mentioned that there's public support of this. Do you think that you have been impacting the, the public's own confidence in being able to access the government and, and hold it accountable? Are you getting feedback that says you're doing what needs to be done and, and it, it's bringing the public along, they're, that they're encouraged by it? I think so. Um, one of the projects we do around transparency is uh, trying to identify pay to play. So we actually publish uh, local political campaign financial donations and that's actually created some news around um, whether or not uh, individuals who have been uh, high dollar donors have received government contracts. Uh, I think that's a lot of people, lay people have been using that data and trying to identify patterns in it and as well as the media. Um, and we hear a lot of uh, in the newspapers, a lot of people saying that they want greater transparency, and there's other groups that have joined the call for government transparency on the island. So I think uh, it's been successful. Well, you know, that's very interesting, and I commend you for that. Uh, you, you said basically that you just put the data out there, pay to play. In other words, here's the government official, and here are the contributions that went to that government official from these businesses. Just put two and two together, and you figure it out. Uh, I mean, is this a put? politicized uh, kind of website where you target particular candidates or do you just put the data out and because of the data is available people naturally follow their curiosity their instincts and use it uh, the, the latter definitely we try not to be political we're not interested in the politics and the you know the horse racing um, we want uh, you know responsible government um, from whoever wants to give that to us whichever party here in Puerto Rico and we want people to really just be able to connect the dots themselves. If the governor of Puerto Rico came to your think tank, and I'm confident someday they will, <laughs> and said, you know, we, we want some impartial, nonpartisan advice on, on how to build our economy, how to have a more transparent government, what would be one of the first things that you might tell him or her as to what Puerto Rico needs to do in order to move in the direction of these free market and democratic principles? Well, you know, one area for sure is how to increase the flexibility in the labor market. Um, we have a number of laws, uh, including those that, you know, require certain types of severance packages. Um, to get a job, you need a doctor's note, even if you're not working in um, healthcare or food handling, um, which is 
uh, cost you about thirty to thirty-five dollars uh, to get. So if you're a low-income person trying to find a job, um, you have to find thirty dollars to pay for a doctor to get a doctor's note to get a job. Um, it, on top of that, there's laws that challenge and make difficult for a lot of organizations to it's set up here in Puerto Rico. Um, there's laws that require certain residency requirements that, uh, and we look at a more globalized economy, um, might cause other companies to take pause and say, well, you know, do we want to jump through the legal hoops? Uh, permitting is an area that's really a challenge on the island uh, in terms of having to go to so many different agencies to open up your storefront. So those are just areas right there where I think there are common sense solutions uh, where anybody um, could say that we're really not creating the environment conducive for job growth. Uh, beyond other things around uh, education and how we can liberate parents to make smarter decisions for their kids and really empower and trust them to, make, to know what their child needs um, and create new opportunities that way as well. Well, all these items that you mentioned, over-regulation, permitting difficulties, labor market regulation, challenges with an educational system. You could be talking from Hawaii as well. And uh, the, uh, we're looking at Puerto Rico as a, a laboratory of what does work and what doesn't work. And we certainly want in our own economy to avoid the kind of impact federal funding and the pulling of federal funding has had in Puerto Rico. So we hope that we can help our economies find other means of shoring themselves up. In closing, would you just share with our, our viewers a vision you have for the future of Puerto Rico? Just very briefly, really the reason you brought the Center for Integrity and Public Policy together. Yeah, my vision for Puerto Rico is one in which people can prosper, um, create opportunities, be entrepreneurial, uh, grow, um, and actually be able to live here and thrive rather than need to look to either the federal government or to leave their homes uh, to find um, the life that's dignified and fulfilling. Well, that's a noble ambition, and I'm so glad the Center for Integrity and Public Policy exists in Puerto Rico. I'm confident that you will thrive, and I look forward to a growing relationship that we will have with each other at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, especially as we tackle problems such as the Jones Act. Alvin, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to our collaboration. My guest today is Alvin Quinones, president and founder of the Center for in Integrity and Public Policy in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And as you see, uh, the world is not all that big. We have similar problems with other regions across the planet. And when we collaborate with each other and look at good research and apply it to public policy, we can find solutions. I'm Kelee Akina with the Grassroot Institute. Until next week on Ehana Kako saying goodbye from the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Aloha. Aloha.